Characteristics of an Effective Clinical Instructor and Amarillo College Clinical Rules and Regulations. And I don't know why I'm talking like an announcer at a golf tournament. So I'm going to stop that and just, well, go on. <laughs> at any rate, here we've got a listing of the items needed. Feel free to pause if you need to, uh, to make sure you've collected all these items or have these available. Otherwise, we'll get started here in just a few seconds. Oh, and before we really get going, uh, fair warning to the person that's acting as moderator that's like handing out the forms and stuff. Be ready to click pause because there are a couple of times during this presentation where you'll need to click pause. So we're going to start off this basketball game by going over some of the objectives. And I know you're perfectly capable of reading and I don't want to bore you with the details. So let me just summarize the objectives by stating that we're going to give you an orientation to working with radiation therapy students in the clinic, as well as uh, an overview of some of our rules and regulations for those students. So on we go. Now let's meet our Amarillo College Radiation Therapy faculty. I am Tony Tackett, the program director, and as you can tell, the years have not been very kind to me. And our primary clinical coordinator is Candy Habiger, and it looks like she's kind of giving me the evil eye there, huh? And we'll talk about the role of the clinical coordinator in just a minute. And here's a picture of me before this teaching thing started really getting to me. And uh, uh, over to the right there is our other faculty member, our part-time lab instructor and clinical coordinator as well, Dale Barker. So let's define some terms with respect to educational personnel involved in training the radiation therapy student. First off is the clinical instructor. That's the registered radiation therapist. That's you who will be supervising and guiding the educational experiences along the student's uh, path. And we'll be talking a little bit more about your role in just a moment. Next is the clinical supervisor. The clinical supervisor is a radiation therapist that has to have at least three years experience as a radiation therapist. And they basically serve as the liaison between the clinical site and the college. They're the person really identified as kind of the go-to person uh, for the student and for the college really. Uh, located at the clinical site. So it's a clinical staff personnel uh, working at the clinical facility that's identified to be the clinical supervisor. Next is the clinical coordinator. This person is a college employee that works with the clinical supervisors to direct student activities and rotations. They kind of give the clinical supervisor some guidance on uh, how to uh, direct student activities and where to send them for their rotations. They also serve as the contact point between the college and the clinical facility. So if uh, there's questions or concerns along the way, then the clinical coordinator of the college is kind of the, the go-to person at the college to, to contact or to talk to. And then there's the program director. That's the person that oversees the whole of the educational program. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. The clinical instructor, or CI. That's you, the staff radiation therapist. And if you're new to our program, this may be a new role for you. And the clinical instructor, the CI, is, as the first bullet states, a treating radiation therapist. That's, that's you, again. Now, one thing we emphasize to the students, and of course, you, you know this, patients come first. Patients are top priority. Patients are number one. We can't emphasize that enough. That said, the CI also gives instruction to students. And it's not always an easy transition from going to being a, a, a treating radiation therapist to being a learning facilitator for the students. But one thing to think about is that you actually spend more time with the students than the program faculty do. Depending on the semester, you spend two to three and a half days, full days, a week with a student, which is more time than the students are involved in their academics. So they get they really get their hands-on experience from you. And they get their interaction skills by walk, watching and working with you. Uh, students will be given objectives for their specific rotations. We'll share those with you as well. But in short, students will be carrying around their objectives. They, they're going to be walking around holding on to the things that they need to know. And they'll be asking you questions. And we, we start off very easy, very you know, with very small bite-sized pieces of things we want them to be able to do. And it builds with each semester until finally they're doing lots and lots of stuff by the time they're getting ready to graduate. They're just basically entry-level radiation therapists is what we want to have them experience as a, a, upon graduation. The last little thing here is, uh, this is a quote that I found while doing some research for this uh, course, and it says, the quality of the educational experience of a radiation therapy student is directly related to the involvement of the staff therapist with the student therapist. So the more involved you are in working with the student, the better experience, the better learning, the better education the student is going to have. It's really as simple as that. 
And as for the clinical supervisor, we'll send each clinical supervisor a short little video kind of outlining their role. Essentially, the role as far as the clinical instructor is concerned of the clinical supervisor is to act as a liaison between the college and the clinical facility. That basically means that if the student has questions about like where they need to be for their rotation, like are they going to be in the sim area or the linear accelerator, then the clinical supervisor will give direction with respect to those kinds of questions. Additionally, if the clinical instructors have questions about where students are supposed to be or if they've got concerns about a student, then the first go-to person is the clinical supervisor and then we can move up the chain, so to speak, to the clinical coordinator and program director if more direction is requested or needed. So being a clinical education facility can certainly benefit the clinical facility itself, but it also can provide some benefits to the clinical staff. One of the benefits that's kind of an indirect benefit is that students can provide a net benefit with respect to workload. That is to say that by the time they've completed about a third of their machine rotation clinical hours anyway, they're typically acclimated well enough to the routines to provide a net benefit with respect to workload. And by the last semester or two, they sometimes can feel like they're another clinical staff member and they're part of the team. Now here's a really kind of an interesting one. Research actually indicates an overall increased job satisfaction rate among staff members in hospital teaching institutions that is related to the teaching environment itself. Now, this might seem sort of counterintuitive to some people at first glance, and it's not uncommon that staff may you know, grumble at times with respect to working with students. But research that controls for variables actually indicates that teaching facilities have staff with higher levels of job satisfaction and that the increased job satisfaction rate is related to working with students. Now staff might sometimes rather balk at the extra responsibilities, but in this case the research actually indicates that the extra responsibilities, of course with some exceptions with individuals, tend to increase overall job satisfaction. So how does this work? I mean, how, how can this be? Well, as a kind of an analogy, the easy choice is to not work with students. I mean, it's, it's less responsibilities to do that. That's the easy choice. But the easy choice is not always the most rewarding choice. Just kind of as an example, if I give my son the choice of practicing his French horn, he's a music major in college right now, so if I give him the choice of practicing his French horn or playing video games, if I kind of say to him, son, you have your choice. You can spend the next hour either practicing your French horn or playing video games. Well, what do you think he's going to choose? He's going to choose video games. But actually, he even he acknowledges this. Playing his French horn gives him more long-term satisfaction in spite of the extra effort. Indeed, really in no small part because of the extra effort involved. So similarly, while staff may at times not outwardly embrace working with students, and admittedly there's some exceptions to this job satisfaction research, uh, they do have an overall tendency to have a higher level of job satisfaction as a result of sharing their knowledge with students. Interesting. Working with students can actually reduce staff burnout. Staff can well, sometimes get in a rut over time doing the same kind of procedures over and over and over. And students bring fresh faces into the clinic, which you know can help reduce burnout for staff and help them appreciate their own positions better. Additionally, responding to student questions can help staff hone their own critical thinking skills by continually evaluating why they use the techniques they use and even create new ways of improving upon various techniques. Now the sign on the right side of this picture right now says, never stop learning. Students really help us have the opportunity to continue to learn and grow all the time and continually. There's also a certain public recognition attached to the teaching function, and it can help play a role in seeing ourselves as professionals. Playing a role in education of radiation therapy students can enhance the image of the facility within the field of radiation oncology, the broader healthcare community, and really even among the citizens and population of the, the area, really. Being recognized within the community as a teaching institution is really always a plus for the institution and for the staff, and education is actually often an integral part of the clinic's mission statement. And a little food for thought here. Just as you feel fulfillment in engaging with patients, you have a similar opportunity here in sharing your knowledge and love for the field with the future of our profession. Professionalism, really in no small part, means that we actively engage in activities that enhance and further the profession. It's, it's, this is not something we vote on whether or not we're going to do. It's something we simply do because guiding 
and, and in educating literally the future of our profession is, is really the most direct and meaningful way in which we can sustain and advance the profession. Thus, education is really a cornerstone of professionalism. It safeguards and directs the very future of our field. So really, th this literally is an opportunity for you for personal and professional growth. And just like we tell our students, and we really do emphasize this, that they are ultimately responsible for their own education, it's really up to you to take advantage of this opportunity to work with students and to learn and grow from and with the students. All right, so next we have some audience participation. We've got an activity here I want you to do, and it's, it's easy. Don't worry about it. It's a little piece of cake. So you're going to need some scratch paper and a pencil, and you're going to be writing some stuff. Print very legibly, if you would. What I want you to do is think of a radiation therapist or maybe kind of several radiation therapists, kind of an amalgam or a compilation of radiation therapists in your past or maybe even people you, people you work with now. I, I don't want you to ever write down names, no names. But I want you to think of radiation therapists like uh, that you think of as being really top-notch radiation therapists, people that you really want to model and emulate as a radiation therapist. I, I can think of, for example, when I was a student, there were two radiation therapists that really just stand out as people that I remember thinking at that time, that's what I want to be like as a radiation therapist. So think of people kind of like that. Now what I want you to do is to write down, and don't you don't have to write down this yet. Wait until I finish the instructions. I want you to write down the character traits or behaviors that you can recall that really made those people or that person stand out as a truly outstanding radiation therapist, someone that you really wanted to be like. I want you to use short phrases or even single words, so don't write long sentences or long paragraphs, just little bullet phrases or maybe even single words. They were like this or they were like that. And I want you to think of, if you can, oh, at least say five to eight characteristics, behaviors, traits, that you can associate with that person as, as demonstrating that they were an outstanding radiation therapist. If there's three or fewer of you watching this right now, make it seven to ten just so we have a good number of traits to kind of uh, go with, so to speak. And then once you get done, consider this like a, a homework, as it, as it were, and just kind of hand in your paper face down to the person that's kind of monitoring this or proctoring this, this uh, continuing education seminar. And then we'll kind of come back to this in just a little bit. So once you get kind of the countdown clock to give you some time to kind of write this stuff down, then you can begin with this, this activity.
Okay, so sit tight on that activity for just a little bit. We will come back to that in just a couple of minutes. Uh, but first I want to give you some background about teaching and learning styles as this is going to relate to that activity you just did. Now before you can develop a teaching style, you need to think about student learning styles. And using some educational jargon here, we've got three domains of learning. The cognitive domain, the psychomotor domain, and the affective domain. And it takes success in all three domains to be a competent therapist. Now what is meant by cognitive, psychomotor, and affective? Well, students in the radiation therapy program curriculum are required to gain information and be tested and evaluated really over the cognitive domain, the affective domain, and the psychomotor domain. The cognitive domain, the first one listed there, you can think of that as really being essentially textbook knowledge or classroom kind of knowledge, uh, uh, academic kind of stuff. If you think about the information that you were asked on your ARRT exam, the registry exam, that's pretty much or mostly cognitive kinds of skills and cognitive kinds of knowledges. The affective domain, well, that's a little different. That's more or less relating to attitudes, feelings, beliefs, values, judgments, ethics, um, communication skills are included in the affective domain. Really kind of what we collectively refer to as soft skills that are required to be an effective uh, communicator with respect to uh, patients and interacting with everyone around you. The psychomotor domain is basically technical skills or, or clinical skills, really like physical movement skills. If somebody has a, a good sense for being able to move the pendant and uh, uh, the console and operate the console, uh, move patients around uh, effectively and get them lined up really quickly and easily, then they have good psychomotor skills. So those are more the the strict clinical skills really. So that's really kind of what's meant by the cognitive, affective, and psychomotor domains. Okay, so now coming back to that activity you just completed a couple of minutes ago, here's what I want you to do. I want the proctor, the person that's kind of running the show, to pick up all those papers that were submitted face down and sh maybe shuffle them around a little bit. And I want that person to then to start reading all of those items that are listed about the effective or good role models for radiation therapists. And I want you to, after each thing is read, after each little item bullet phrase is read, I want everyone to kind of discuss briefly and agree as to whether or not that statement would fit into the cognitive area, the affective area, or the psychomotor area. So say, for instance, uh, the first thing that's read is that this radiation therapist was great at being patient with working with students and with their patients in general. Well, that would be an affective skill. So we'd kind of mark one down for affective. And I want the proctor to basically count how many of these items fit into cognitive, how many fit into affective, and how many fit into psychomotor. And we're just going to kind of tabulate the results, so to speak. So I'll give you some time to do that activity. If you need a little bit more time, then just kind of hit the pause button. I take that back, actually. I was going to insert the countdown timer again here, but I got to thinking that if there's only a couple of people involved, this might just take just a minute or so. But if there's several people involved, this might take a few minutes. So click pause and take however long you need to tabulate the results of the activity. Okay, so I've been doing this activity near the very end of the program for my students every year for the last oh, decade or so, and every single time we get the, the, the same result. And while there may be some clinics that get a little different result, I'm going to assume that you guys probably got the same result that I get every year with my students, and that you probably saw a lot more little marks in the affective domain than you did in the cognitive or psychomotor domains. So what does that mean? Does that mean that uh, you don't value the psychomotor skills, the clinical skills, or the textbook knowledge that uh, therapists have? Well, of course not. I, I, what I think that this means, and what we've kind of figured out in our discussions with past students, is that you basically, I think, assume that a radiation therapist is going to have the textbook knowledge and the clinical skills to be able to do the job. But what is it that you really value that makes a therapist become somebody that's not just an ordinary radiation therapist, but an extraordinary therapist. What is it that really makes you really look up to a radiation therapist? It's not 
just the psychomotor or the cognitive, again, you assume that those skills are intact and that they're there. It's really the affective skills, the people skills, the soft skills. How do they treat their patients? How do they work with other people around them? How do they work with students? Those are the things that you value or that radiation therapists tend to value that kind of is the, makes a therapist from becoming ordinary to becoming really the cream of the crop. So I, I really want to emphasize this, that the point of this activity is to demonstrate to you that really what is it that students are going to be looking up to you for? They're going to assume that you're technically adequate. They're going to assume that you've got textbook knowledge. But what is it that they're really looking for as a role model? It's the people skills, the affective skills. How do you work with the patients? How do you treat the patients? How do you work with the student? How do you communicate with the student? How effective are you communicating with the student? That's what the students are going to look up to. That's what they're going to, going to really view you as a role model for. So the students see you as a role model. You, know, you, you are a role model. And you had role models of therapists or made role models of therapists when you were a student. And some maybe not so much so as others, and that was probably mostly due to their affective skills or maybe lack thereof. So this is really important, and in fact, in researching this uh, project, this, this course, so to speak, I came across numerous studies that show just as much like this one here that states that the importance of role modeling behavior with respect to clinical instruction. So you are a role model, so do keep that in mind. If you'll allow me to kind of geek out for just a minute, I want to talk about something I've been researching a little bit lately called mirror neurons. And let me read from one of the articles that I researched about mirror neurons. It says, you see a stranger on a video crash their car, like a YouTube or something, you, and they crash their car, and you immediately flinch in sympathy. We've all experienced that, right? Or you're watching a race, and you feel your heart racing with excitement as the runners vie to cross the finish line first. Or you see a woman sniff some unfamiliar food and wrinkle her nose in disgust. Suddenly, your stomach turns at the thought of the meal as well. For years, such experiences have puzzled psychologists, neuroscientists, and philosophers who've wondered why we react at such a gut level to other people's actions. How do we understand so immediately and instinctively their thoughts, feelings, and intentions? Well, now, researchers believe that a discovery called mirror neurons might provide a neuroscience-based answer to those questions. Mirror neurons are a type of brain cell that responds equally when we perform an action and when we witness someone else perform that very same action. So now let's take a look at a more or less definition of mirror neurons. A mirror neuron is a neuron that fires both when a person acts and when a person observes the same action performed by another person. Thus, the neuron mirrors the behavior of the other, as though the observer were itself acting. And then from uh, another part of the paper, it says, Imitation is the fundamental mechanism of human behavior. So, what does this mean? Well, we've all heard the expression, monkey see, monkey do, but, you know, it's actually really true. Students will pick up on and mimic the behaviors they see in the clinical setting. So again, really the point of this is I, I simply can't overstate the importance of your role as a role model for students. All right, enough about role models. Let's move on to student learning styles, how students or really anybody learns. But first, as a precursor to this, let's watch a short little interesting little video. The monkey business illusion. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. The correct answer is 16 passes. Did you spot the gorilla? For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before, about half missed the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it. But did you notice the curtain changing color or the player on the black team leaving the game? 
Let's rewind and watch it again. Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. When you're looking for a gorilla, you often miss other unexpected events. And that's the monkey business illusion. So what's the purpose of watching that video other than the fact it's kind of interesting? Well, sometimes therapists complain about students just not being able to see the big picture, especially early on. Well, of course, really, students, especially early on, are laser focused, like you're trying to focus in on following the basketball passes and trying to memorize the fine details. They're still trying to think of or memorize words like gantry and SSD and wedge and things like this. So they really can't see the big picture early on. And I'll talk a little bit more about this as we go along here. So a little change of pace now. We think that we can multitask. A lot of people think we can multitask, and you know some people can, but most of us, <laughs> maybe not so much. So to kind of demonstrate the weaknesses about our abilities to multitask, for most of us at any rate, I want to do a little test here and see how good you are. So once we go to the next screen, you're going to see a word, and what I want you to do is as soon as you see that word, I want you to shout out as fast as you can the color of the word. Not the word itself, but the color of the word. So right there we've got the word color in purple. So you would say purple as fast as you possibly can. So here we go. Let's see how you guys do with this. Okay, so if you're like most people, uh, your brain probably went into a little bit of a jam there where you saw the word and probably wanted to say the word rather than the color that the word was written in. So, and that's a natural tendency because it's really difficult for our brains to process two things simultaneously. Uh, so it's, it's a real challenge for us to do. So let's give it another go, except for this time, uh, I, well, again, I want you to say the color of the word that you see, or even sometimes just the letter that you see. So you'll either see a letter or a word. And this time, the words are not going to be the colors. Uh, so you won't be confused with that at any rate. But let's see how you do with this one. So again, as soon as the word or letter pops up, say the color of the letter or the word that pops up. So since you didn't have the words conflicting colors with the colors themselves, I bet you probably did a little better on this one. But did you realize that all those words that you were looking at actually constructed a sentence? And if so, can you remember what that sentence was? I've got this now where I can kind of scroll through and show you. The first one was the letter I. Then after that is, oops, if I can control this thing, I don't think you're going to 
remember much of this. <laughs> hmm, so now how did you really do? Did you realize that, that that was a whole sentence that you were looking at? Or were you so focused on trying to get the color out that you weren't paying attention or weren't able to pay attention to the sentence that was being constructed? Now, I did this test on my son. He's always saying, I can multitask. I can do it really well. And I was like, ah, I'll show you. Well, little did I know, he, he aced this thing. <laughs> but I got to say, come to find out later on that he actually had done this test before. So he knew what to look for. Little cheat. <laughs> so anyway, what this is demonstrating is that multitasking is not something that we're typically very good at doing. We typically are really only good at focusing on one thing at a time. So how is it that whenever you uh, do a bunch of things at the same time, you're able to do them at the same time? Like in the clinic, for instance, you can do a lot of things at the same time. Most of that is because you've done it so long and so often that you're not really seeing it as one thing that's being done. You're doing several things at the same time, but your brain is really only recognizing that as one specific little thing to remember. So it's not really being bothered by having to remember this because it's really just integrated it all into one whole. And as it turns out, people who multitask the most are typically the least effective at being able to do it. A 2011 study entitled A Decade of Distraction, How Multitasking Affects Student Outcomes also found a negative relationship between multitasking and overall GPA, or grade point average. Analyses from this study revealed that using social media and texting while doing schoolwork were associated with lowering of GPA. To me, that sounds kind of like a no-brainer, but some people really think they can multitask, but really, typically, we're just not very good at it. Students tend to learn through what's referred to as a pieces, parts, holes pattern. Um, have you ever noticed how new students seem to be really narrowly focused, how they, you, you just want them to kind of step back and see the big picture, but they just can't seem to be able to do that? Well, that's simply because they can't. Any new learner isn't going to be able to see the big picture very well because the first step in learning typically involves rote memorization of little bitty pieces of information. So, you know, it's really hard for students sometimes just to kind of keep up with all the stuff that is in the radiation therapy curriculum with respect to memorization. They just have to memorize all these little bits and pieces and stuff. And it takes a while before they can kind of assemble these pieces into parts. That's the second step. They begin to make connections. They begin to assemble these pieces into parts. And they have a little better understanding of the parts than they do of the pieces. Just to give you kind of an example of this, I remember... Uh, <laughs> It's kind of embarrassing, actually. I remember back in anatomy class, I had the hardest time at first remembering which side of the large colon or large intestine was the splenic flexure and which part was the hepatic flexure. And then as I looked at this more carefully and over time, I, I made the connection, oh, duh, the splenic flexure is on the same side as the spleen and the hepatic flexure is on the same side as the liver. I mean, duh. But, you know, that's an example, a classic example of, at first I was looking at it as little bitty separate pieces, and then I was able to see it as connected to something a little bit more holistic. So that's the first step, rote memorization of pieces. Then the second step is making assemblies, assembling some of these pieces into uh, parts. And then finally, we can integrate this better into whole connections. This is where students connect all the parts to make holes. And this really represents integration. And that's, once, once a student is able to integrate knowledge and information, that's where they can see all of the steps as being just one large whole. And that's where you are. You can do all these things. You can multitask, or what seems like multitasking, because your brain is really acknowledging or recognizing all these things, again, like I just mentioned, as one large whole instead of a bunch of separate individual little bitty pieces. But students just aren't there for a while. And our academic pattern, I'm going to talk a little bit about this later on. Sorry, I got a phone call interruption there. So at any rate, our academic pattern really does kind of follow this pieces, parts, holes pattern, if you will, really, where in the first semester, we give them a little bit of information about pretty much everything. <laughs> and then in subsequent semesters, we kind of tease that apart and help them make better connections by having had access to that information 
before and learning more aspects of those bits of information. And then towards the end of the program, we really kind of integrate it into larger holes as we get them ready for their exit exams and the registry exam and for uh, the, the clinical readiness as well. In addition to all that, there's different learning styles for different students. Some students are visual learners. They like to see what they're learning. Other people are auditory learners. They hear it and they are able to integrate it pretty well. Other people are kinesthetic. They're, they're doers. They just learn by doing it. And many of us are actually kind of combinations of these different styles. But just because somebody, well, if there's somebody that's a kinesthetic learner, they're probably going to do really well in the clinical stuff right away. But just because somebody maybe is a more auditory learner doesn't mean that they're not going to be good in the clinic. It just might take them a little more time, but they might be able to integrate it more thoroughly over time. So don't form a negative opinion of the student based simply on their differences in their learning styles. A student might be kind of shy or timid and maybe not jump right in right away. And, and we might be thinking to ourselves, oh, that person's just not really showing like they're interested in what's going on at all. Now, we certainly do want students to get involved as soon as possible. But simply being a little on the shy side does not necessarily equal that they don't care about what's going on. I guess I can kind of relate to this. I'm, I'm a little bit more of an observer and watcher kind of personality rather than a jump right in there kind of person. And I'm also not really a kinesthetic person. It, it really kind of takes me some time to learn physical skills, but once I get the hang of them, I really do quite well. It just takes me longer in the beginning is all. Students also sometimes get what they perceive to be conflicting messages from us. We tell them, patient safety, patient care, be safe, be safe, be safe. And then we tell them, jump in, don't hesitate, get right in there. So students can sometimes have a really hard time kind of walking this seemingly contradictory tightrope of messages that they get. Students are also sometimes kind of scared or intimidated by the equipment. I mean, they're afraid of breaking the equipment or hurting the patients. I, I, I remember, I distinctly remember in my observation before I got accepted into the radiation therapy program, the first time I walked into a, a vault and saw a LINAC, I was like, oh my gosh, that's a big, big expensive piece of equipment. I don't know that if I can run, I don't know if I can do that. I just don't know if I can do this. And then I thought to myself right away, and it really helped me, I thought, you know, a car is a big piece of equipment that can be dangerous if not operated safely and effectively. And this radiation therapy training program is a lot longer training than what my driver's education classes were. So that made me feel a little better and more secure about doing that. And I, I relate that story to students as well so that maybe they won't feel as intimidated. Uh, by the equipment. So let students operate the equipment in safe conditions, especially early on. Um, before they even get acclimated to the machine and the pendant itself, let them set up the room between patients, get them familiar with the room. And these are in their objectives, actually. And I want them to practice pendant control between patients every chance they, that there is, really. Uh, and I emphasize this to the students as well. So maybe, you know, put a piece of masking tape on the table between patients or when there's a break uh, at lunch or any time that there's uh, not anything going on in the treatment room, put a piece of masking tape on the table, uh, get a sharpie, put a dot on there, and have the student practice moving the table in and out and left and right and up and down for setting SSDs and stuff. Give them that, that, that practice and let them have that practice as much as is possible, especially early on. Because our orientations with the students, in our orientations with the students, I really emphasize to students that the sooner they get proficient with the pendant, the more you're going to let them do with the pendant and with patients as well. Okay, so we've talked about how students learn for a while. Now let's talk about teaching strategies. First thing, don't forget you are the expert, but also remember the student has a lot of expertise in many other areas outside of radiation therapy that can be beneficial to them in the clinic. I remember I had a student many years ago that was had a, a social work certification, and that was really helpful to her. So students bring in a lot of other knowledge that we may not have. Now, you know a lot more about radiation therapy than the student, but that doesn't mean that the student doesn't know anything about, well, <laughs> anything. I learn from students every year. I've been doing this for more than a quarter of a century. It hasn't been that long. But I, I'm telling you, I learn stuff every year from the students. They're a great resource for me. So, some generic kinds of teaching strategies kind of like the generic linear accelerator photo you see there. <laughs> uh, integrate asking questions into your routines. You don't want to intimidate the students, but you know, ask questions. Uh, 
Thinking out loud is a really great tool for students. I mean, you guys have been doing this for so long now that you know you don't really have to communicate or talk out loud a lot with each other. I remember working with a staff therapist where we just kind of read each other's minds, basically. We had worked together so long and so well that we just kind of knew what the other was doing, and there wasn't a, not a lot of need for verbal communication. Well, students <laughs> don't get that very well. So uh, think out loud, you know, kind of say things as you're doing them a little bit, kind of with the student in mind. Have the student explain steps to you. If they can explain the steps, then they maybe better understand the steps of what's going on. Now don't ask it in kind of a, a like a accusatory way, but just kind of, just, you know, say, can you explain what you're doing there? And I just want to check your understanding and that's fine. That's good enough. Have the student identify problems. If something comes up or you see something unusual or different, or if a, a patient isn't lining up right, ask the student if they can identify what the issue could be with that. Of course, you won't, don't want to do that in front of the patient, uh, maybe outside the room later on. Ask the student how could it be maybe be done better. One of the great tools that I got from a, a therapist when I was a student was I was having trouble with routines. I was having trouble really getting the hang of the routines. And a therapist, and this still sticks with me all these decades later, the, the therapist was like, Tony, as you're doing one thing, ask yourself, what's next? What's the next thing? So as you're doing one thing with respect to getting the room set up for the next patient, ask yourself, what's the next thing I need to get to get the room set up for the patient or uh, for the treatment process? And once I started doing that, man, things really started clicking into place a whole lot better. So that might be something you might recommend to students. We talk about that too, but... Uh, you want to kind of reinforce this as well in the clinic. Have the students ask themselves, what's next? What's next? What's next? It's a great way to kind of help establish routines. Some generic ways of improving teaching. You can ask yourself the following questions, like what sort of questioning techniques do you use? Open or closed questions? Closed questions are questions that are typically answered with a one-word response, like yes or no. They don't usually evoke a lot of thought. Uh, so you want to try to ask open-ended questions where the student can describe a process rather than just simply say yes or no. How much time do you spend talking instead of listening to the student? And do you let the student explain their needs to you? So teachers talk, but teachers also should be able to listen to the student. Number three, this is a big one, I think. What tone of voice do you use? Is it intimidating? Is it accusatory? Is it uh, uh, placating? Is it condescending? Uh, students really pick up on the way you say things just as much as what you say. So really try to monitor your tone of voice. What do you do when the student cannot answer the question? I mean, how do you just kind of harumph and kind of like, or do you kind of, if the student can't answer a question, do you kind of work with the student to kind of help them to get the answers to their questions or to your questions. Number five, I think this is also another kind of big one in my mind. How do you respond when the student asks a question where you don't know the answer? Sometimes students are going to ask questions where you're kind of like, I don't know, and it can feel kind of intimidating, but really it's perfectly okay to say, you know, I don't know or I don't remember, but let's see if we can figure out a response for that or I'll get back to you tomorrow and we'll see if we can uh, address that question. So students really kind of respect when you can say, I don't know, but you work with them to find answers to their questions. Responsibilities of assessing. Assessing is just a fancy educator's way of saying grading. <laughs> but I, I, I really, I want to really emphasize the importance of accurate grading. Now, I don't, I don't think this has really been a problem for us for a while, but there's been times in the past where sometimes a therapist would say, man, this student just isn't getting it. They're just not doing well at all. They're not where they need to be. And, and then they give them all A's in every category and every criteria. And we're kind of like, you know, that kind of ties our hands. We really can't do anything about that. So grading accurately is really important. But some points to think about here, be fair and, as ob and objective as much as is possible. Give honest assessments. Uh, again, really rate them accurately. That's really important. Don't assess their overall performance based on one treatment procedure. That may not tell the whole picture, really. Final assessments, end of the rotation evaluations, should be a summary of the student's progress or maybe lack of progress. Don't let the final assessment be the first time the student hears about a situation. Students should not be surprised. Now we've got a tool we'll talk about a little bit later on that kind of helps out with that. But basically keep communicating with students about how they're doing and what your, what your expectations are uh, for them. And that's the next thing. Let the students know what your expectations are very early on. 
And when you do grade, focus on behaviors rather than their personality. Comments should never be personal. So don't say things or don't write things in their evaluations like, you are X, Y, and Z. Say things like, um, you know, I'm seeing X, Y, and Z behavior going on. So phrasing criticisms like that really can be, can, can make it feel a, a lot less like a personal attack if it's done that way. Record keeping. I'm going to skip to the bottom of this frame right now and talk about rotations. I've been mentioning rotations. It's worth mentioning that students typically have three clinical rotations per semester. This can vary a little bit from facility to facility. But by and large, we go with three clinical rotations per semester. Each rotation lasts about four or five weeks, kind of depending on the semester. Again, this can vary, especially with distance sites. But at the end of each rotation, in other words, on a semi-regular basis, you know, typically about three times a semester, a student is going to get evaluated formally. And these evaluations are going to be done online. We'll send you a short tutorial on how to access this information. But with respect to record keeping, we really don't specifically require clinical instructors to keep specific records about students, basically. <laughs> uh, you, you do type in those evaluations at the end of the rotation, but you really do need to be able to give examples of things that you see. If you have positive comments to give to students, and we really want to um, uh, reinforce that positive information and positive comments are great for students to hear. They need to hear that. They need to know where they're doing well. If they have a negative uh, constructive constructive criticisms, then those need to be commented on as well. So you need to be able to give examples of things that you see. So while you don't specifically have to keep records, you have to be able to do this at the end of the rotation. So what we recommend is that you maybe just simply take notes as you see things going on that are uh, things you want to comment on either negatively or positively about a student. Take some notes and maybe at the end of the day type it up real quick in an email, send that email to yourself and just kind of keep that as your documentation so to speak. But you want to make sure that your records, whatever method you use for records, are safe and secure and they're not something the student or anybody else can have access to. So if you take hand notes then take them home with you and throw them in the trash or something. Uh, but that's really all I have to say about record keeping. Next up is the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, known as FERPA. Again, I just like to say FERPA. You can think of FERPA really as being the HIPAA for students, kind of the privacy rights for students. And any student enrolled in a public college or university has certain privacy rights. Now, we can publish things like their name, address, phone number, email address, and stuff, but there's certain things that you cannot talk about. So some of the things that can't be disclosed by uh, anybody really is things like uh, social security number, uh, race, ethnicity, nationality, gender, transcripts or grade reports. We can only disclose those to other people in the college institution that have a vested interest in being able to get that information like teachers for instance reporting to the registrar's office the grades. So basically, I think a, a, probably a good rule of thumb is if somebody calls up the student and asks about a student, all you can do basically, all you should really do is just transfer them to the student and let the student say whatever they need to say. But don't you disclose really anything about the student. The only time you might could disclose information is as you see at the bottom of the screen, is if there's a health or safety emergency, then you can call it like if a student has a, a, a health crisis while in the clinic, then you can reach out and call the parents and notify them. You'll be okay. But you can't talk in routinely anyway. You can't talk about things like if somebody asks, when, do this, when does the student graduate? How are their grades doing? Things like that. So I got tired of putting images of legal symbols in these slides. So there's a picture of my dog. <laughs> she's lost a little weight since then, but she's a cutie anyway. But how can FERPA affect a clinical instructor? Again, this is a big legal kind of thing, so you want to be careful. And our rule of thumb, again, you can talk about students' progress and grades and stuff to, like, the clinical supervisor, to the clinical coordinator from the college, or the program director from the college. But if anybody just calls in, like sometimes a parent may call in and, and say, how's my, how's my son doing? I'm paying for his schooling and I want to make sure that he's passing all the classes and passing, doing well in the clinical stuff. You cannot disclose that information. Again, follow that basic rule of thumb. You, you can transfer him to the student and say, well, I can let the student, them, so I can let your son talk to you directly about that. But you can't talk about anything like that. That's a big legal kind of thing. So just do be mindful of that. You can talk to, again, clinical supervisor, clinical coordinator, or program director. But great rule of thumb, 
Don't mess around with talking about any aspect of a student's progress to anybody else. So I got a little tired of putting images of legal symbols on these slides, so there's a picture of my dog. She's lost a little weight since then, thankfully, but she's a cutie anyway. At any rate, how can FERPA affect a clinical instructor? Uh, again, great rule of thumb. Uh, you can disclose information about a student to like uh, uh, the clinical supervisor or clinical coordinator, program director, anybody that is a representative of the college and the clinical supervisor is a representative of the college when they are discussing grades of students in the clinical setting. But otherwise, again, don't say nothing to nobody. Bad grammar. Don't say anything to anybody. Uh, so <laughs> uh, that's our rule of thumb. Uh, just as kind of an example, uh, sometimes I, I had a, 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 the wife of a student a couple of years ago call and she was asking, I couldn't get information from my husband, but I need to find out when he's scheduled to graduate. He, I, I'm under the impression that he only has just this semester and then he'll be done. Well, the student was just in their very first semester of the program, so they still had a ways to go. <laughs> so I could not directly address that because that's talking about you know information that's related to a student's progress basically so what I did is I told her that I couldn't disclose that information but I did tell her that that information is published on our program website and I gave her the program website and she you know basically said you can look it up yourself so food for thought or essentially generalized comments for now be mindful of your use of jargon with new students. I remember in my first semester in radiation therapy school, uh, the teacher kept talking about these things called port films. And finally, I raised my hand about halfway through the semester and said, what's a port film? And the teacher was like, oh, gosh. And the other students were like, I'm so glad you asked because I didn't know either. So you know this whole other new language that the students haven't picked up on yet. So be mindful of that. Next, don't get caught up in gossiping around the student because gossiping is kind of a mirror neuron kind of thing, so the students can pick up on that and start gossiping themselves, and I don't think you want that to happen. The next one essentially says, you know how, if you've raised kids, <laughs> then you know this. <laughs> Sometimes a kid will go to one parent and ask for something, and that parent says no. And so what does a kid do? They go to the other parent, <laughs> trying to play both angles, so to speak. So sometimes students will try to do that kind of thing as well, be aware of that. Don't let it happen. Don't let them get away with it. The next one is a comment from a past student who said the most fair clinical instructors expected me to learn and showed me that they cared about my progress. Enough said. Next, tell the student right away as something happens, not only at the end of the rotation evaluation. So a lot of times students are kind of like, they'll see their evaluations at the end and kind of like, I didn't know that was a problem. But if I would have known that was a problem, I'd have done something about it and tried to change that behavior you know, weeks ago. So let them know right away as soon as you get a chance that uh, something is going on that needs to be corrected. And the next one, don't correct a student in front of the patient or other staff or other students. Do it in a private setting if at all possible, but just that's not a professional thing to do in front of other patients or other staff or other people around. So just do it kind of one-on-one. -on -one. And here's another comment from a student. Encourage me and I will not forget you. So you're basically halfway through suffering through this presentation. Isn't continuing education fun? Anyway, if you're viewing this all at once, please feel free to take a break of no more than five minutes, then load up the web page for part two. Regardless of whenever you view part two, please note that part two is a discussion of the clinical instructor handbook, which covers the basic rules and regulations for students in the clinic with which clinical instructors need to be familiar. So be sure to have a copy of that handbook printed out for all participants. And that ends the first half of this presentation.